I am mute. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome once again to the weekly media briefing with Montgomery County Executive Mark Elrich, as well as the public health update. Today, joining the county executive, we have several guests, including Dr. James Bridgers, who is the acting health officer, Dr. Earl Stoddar, assistant chief administrative officer, Mr. Sean O'Donnell and Ms. Kimberly Townsend, both from the Department of Health and Human Services, as well as the director for that department, Dr. Raymond Crowell. Joining us also is Council President Gabe Albornoz, and uh, this week's special guest is Health Officer nominee, Dr. Kisha Davis. Members of the media, please do use the chat when uh, we open it up for the Q&A portion of this presentation. And with that, I toss it to you, Mr. County Executive. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, I'm going to start um, by talking about the health officer. I'm excited to share the news. Montgomery County has offered the position of health officer to Dr. Keisha Davis. Today, we sent our nomination to the County Council, and I want to thank Dr. James Bridgers for the work he did in filling the dual role of acting health officer and chief public health services, chief of public health services for the past 13 months. Uh, Dr. Davis is a family physician, currently vice president of health equity at Aledale here in Montgomery County. She has administrative and leadership experience from her time with Vax Care Corporation, and she also served as medical director at CHI Healthcare, a primary care center in Gaithersburg. She's also been a White House fellow and serves on the vice, as vice chair of the Medicaid and CHIP Payment and Access Commission. She earned her Master's of Public Health from Johns Hopkins University and her MD from the University of Connecticut School of Medicine. Dr. Davis is a Montgomery County native, and she actually graduated from Quince Orchard High School. And it's important to note that this is a joint appointment with the state. Her nomination has already been reviewed and approved by the State of Maryland Department of Health. I'm looking forward to welcoming and working with Dr. Davis in her new position. And now I'd like to turn this over to uh, both Dr. Davis, and I know that um, Council President Overnose wanted to make a couple of remarks. So I'll turn it back to you, Lorna. Go ahead, Mr. Council President, your remarks. Well, thank you so much. I, we really want to express our appreciation to the county executive for sending this nomination over. Uh, we do want to begin by thanking Dr. Bridgers for his dedication and his work over the last year plus. Uh, he has been an outstanding advocate. He has been an outstanding partner with the council sitting as the Board of Health through some of the most challenging times in our county's history and has led with great strength. And we appreciate that leadership and uh, as we deliberate and discuss shortly uh, Dr. Davis's uh, appointment, we will all have the opportunity to make similar comments publicly, but I wanted to, do, to start that now. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Bridgers, and thank you, Dr. Kroll, and the entire Department of Health and Human Services for your, your leadership through this time. Um, Dr. Davis's resume speaks for itself. It is extraordinary, and the fact that she is a local Montgomery County resident uh, born and raised here is also extraordinary as well. I had the opportunity to meet Dr. Davis personally uh, several years ago and was immediately impressed uh, by her. And uh, the council looks very much forward to taking up this nomination. Uh, we will be uh, interviewing Dr. Davis formally on November 15th and plan on taking action that same day so that Dr. Davis uh, can get to work as soon as possible. So uh, I just wanted to make those introductory opening comments for now on behalf of all of my colleagues. This is a good day in Montgomery County. Uh, we look forward to the conversation with Dr. Davis when we formally have the opportunity to interview her. And I'm gonna step down now from this Zoom and allow her uh, to speak on her own behalf. So with that, Lorna, I will turn it back over to you, but thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Connell, Council President for joining us today. And now it's your turn, Dr. Davis. Good afternoon. And welcome. Thank you, Lorna. Thank you, County Executive Elridge. Thank you, County President Albernaz. I'm so excited to be coming before you today. As was mentioned, Montgomery County is where I was born and bred. Um, just to give a little flavor about me, I'll do a few opening comments and then uh, we can do a few questions. My um, grandfather's grandfather, uh, newly out of slavery, helped to build one of the first schoolhouses for colored children in Montgomery County. And the leg legacy of service in my family goes back to just after the Civil War. And for me, this position is coming full service. 
of being in service to the county and the people that are here. As was mentioned, I'm a family physician. Um, and I remember back when I was an intern, uh, newly minted, looking at the board of patients that were on the wall and who it was that I had to round on that day. And there were 13 on the board, but only five of them that I needed to see. And I commented to my chief, oh, it looks like, you know, not too busy a day, only five that I have to see. And he responded back to me, hmm, they are all your patients. And that has been my mantra and guiding principle in everything that I've done. Um, after residency, I joined a community health center in Columbia, Maryland. And while there became um, frustrated with I was seeing patients with diabetes and I would do everything that I could in the office to help them, but still more patients with diabetes came. And me and my exam room, their prescriptions were bigger than my, their, their problems were bigger than my prescription pad. I couldn't fix the fact that they didn't have a safe place to walk or didn't understand nutrition labels or um, didn't have nutritious food that would help their, their problems. And so I used that knowledge to really say, what else can I be doing? How can I better understand uh, the healthcare system? And so I pursued a White House fellowship um, and in that fellowship, I worked at the U.S. Department of Agriculture, really looking at the food safety net and the health safety net and what is the interplay between the two of those. How do we think about healthier communities for patients, recognizing that part of health happens in the exam room, but a lot of health happens outside of that. And I think if there's anything that we learn from COVID, um, there's only so much that we can do, you know, uh, there's so much opportunity outside of just um, in that exam room. After the fellowship, I uh, helped to open a brand new practice called uh, Casey Health Institute, then later changed its name to Chi Healthcare in Gaithersburg, Maryland. And we later moved to Rockville, where we really focused on providing whole person care primary care, thinking about how do we center the needs of, that, of those patients, providing care uh, to patients insured and uninsured, Medicare and Medicaid, um, really trying to be of and for the community. When I think about medical practice, it is about the patient that is, in, that is sitting in front of you, but it is also about the community that surrounds you because really they are all your patients. When that practice closed, um, I had the privilege of joining a company called Allidate that's actually based in Bethesda uh, that helps support independent primary care physicians, um, both in private practice and community health centers. Um, and currently I'm in the role of vice president of health equity, making sure that we are delivering high quality equitable care to all of our patients. And so again, for me, it's how are we doing this for all of our patients? And you know, in this role, I see myself as, really being that primary care doc for Montgomery County. Um, and ex I'm excited to serve in the role. I'm excited to work with this high quality team of folks. Um, I'm thankful for the foundation that has been laid in the past by Dr. Gales and Dr. Bridgers. They've done such a good job um, in responding to COVID. Really Montgomery County is, is top in the nation for our response. And so excited to join this excellent team um, and, and really to come back home. Thank you, Dr. Davis. Members of the media, we're going to open a Q&A portion right now for your questions for the county executive and or Dr. Davis and uh, the council president. I see on the chat that Stephanie Ramirez, Fox 5, has questions for Dr. Davis. Good afternoon, Stephanie. You need to unmute Stephanie. Okay, you can all hear me and see me, right? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. You think I get it now? All right. So, um, Dr. Davis, thank you very much for your time here. I, I want to ask um, a few questions, if that's okay. I, one issue um, with the position we all know is that Dr. Travis Gales faced uh, a lot of threats because of positions that were taken during the COVID pandemic, and that afterward the county went through more than one candidate trying to fill that position. Um, did you have any concerns there? Why did you decide you wanted to uh, take on this role? And uh, when did you apply? So it's been an ongoing process. You know, I'll, I'll say just um, comment briefly on kind of what, what Dr. Gale's experience. I think COVID in some ways brought out the best and the worst of us. 
as people, right? It, it in some way showed us how we could work together, how we could work collaboratively, collaboratively, how we could pull across lines to bring resources together. And in some ways it brought out the worst um, in terms of some of the, you know, furor that was uh, thrown at him. I am encouraged by the support that the county gave him. And I hope that we are getting back to a period of more civility um, and, you know, respect for the role. I am a Montgomery County resident, just like everybody else, and I'm accountable to the residents and the soccer moms too, who I, you know, who my kids play with. And so I think having that level of civility is, is really important. Um, as mentioned before, I am a Montgomery County native for generations and generations, and so I am here to stay. Um, you know, my kids go to Montgomery County Public Schools, my husband works here. Um, and so that uh, commitment to this county is, is quite strong for me. Um, and then another question for you. So the, the school system and the county get their direction on COVID policies and, and other matters from the chief, the chief health officer. Um, when it comes to the school closures, the masking, vaccine requirements that we saw, is there anything since you, you know, seem to have experienced this with your children, is there anything that you would have done differently or would you do the same thing over again? You know, I'm not here to play Monday morning quarterback, but when you look at the outcomes that we have had um, and the success rate that we've had in COVID, I would say we are sitting in a really good place. Um, we have very high vaccination rates. We have seen, you know, we have one of the lowest death rates in the country uh, when you look at COVID. And so um, in terms of where we have gotten now, I think we have done a really good job. The school system has now a, a chief medical officer in place, Dr. Kapunin, and I look forward to working with her um, and having that collaboration as we think about the children of Montgomery County. And then lastly, did, um, I, it's my understanding that you know Dr. Travis Gales. Can you talk a little bit about some of the conversations that were had before applying for this position? I, Dr. Gales and I have gone to school together. I think he has done a good job in the role and um, I you know, am proud of the work that he has done. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, Katie Ree, DC News Now, I see that you posted a question in the chat. Do you want me to read it or do you want to ask it? Oh, there you are. Go ahead and ask. Sorry, not to forget about this. Um, so we can't hear you. You can't hear me. Okay. Um, you guys hear me now? Yes. Okay. So you, again, like Stephanie, I think you'd have this figured out by now. You might want to come closer to your mic, I think, because we lose the audio. Yeah. So there has been a rise in RSV cases, in flu cases, and now also COVID cases. Some health officials are calling it a triple demic. So, you know, what are those risks of this triple demic and having all of those illnesses at the same time? But also, could this be a step back towards masking? You know, I think it's too early to tell at this point, and I, you know, look forward to working with uh, Dr. Bridgers and the, you know, health department and really figuring out what is the best thing to go forward. I think we have learned a lot um, in terms of when to use masks and when not to and what the, you know, the best use of them is, and I think that's a bridge that we cross when we get there. Um, and I think, you know, there, there is a lot of fear that might be put out there. And I think really getting back to transparency, what are the risks? What are the numbers? What are we really seeing? Um, and I think, you know, again, Montgomery County has done a good job so far in responding to these. And I think we've got that muscle memory um, and have laid really strong uh, protocols in place for responding to, to all of these things that are coming our way. Gotcha, and one last follow-up question. If these cases do start trending higher to a point of concern for health officials here in Maryland or elsewhere across the country. Would that be something you would be willing to put in place uh, to try and bring those numbers back down? I'm sorry, you're breaking up. Can you repeat the question or put it in the chat? If those risk levels do uh, reach a level of concern, is the mass, is a mask mandate or something along those lines something you'd be willing to put in place. I think that's a bridge that we have to cross when we get there. Thank you. 
Thank you, Katie. Uh, members of the media, if you have any more questions uh, for Dr. Davis, this is your time to go ahead and ask. I'll wait a second. I do not see any more questions in the chat, but I'll wait a couple of seconds to see if anybody else has any questions for the nominee. Hey, Lauren, if you can hear me, I, I do have some more questions. I want to give some other folks a chance, but if I can jump in again. I don't see anybody else, so I guess you can go oh, ahead, Stephanie. Okay. I, I think we're on. I don't know. <laughs> All right. So, um, yes, uh, Dr. Davis. Um, so, can you kind of talk about, or if another official can, um, the role that you would have on impacting um, the, the impact on kids, especially in school. You had mentioned that MCPS has their own um, health officer now. We know traditionally it was the county health officer who was making recommendations. What, what is the, the actual role now um, when it comes to making decisions, the impact on kids, the impact on families as well? I'll actually defer that to Dr. Kroll or Dr. Bridgers in terms of what that kind of uh, synergy looks like at this point, because I think it's in, in flux. Go ahead, Dr. Bridgers. Sure, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Davis, and uh, good afternoon, Stephanie. So we've built a strong collaboration with our MCPS partners. Uh, in principle, with Dr. Kapunin, as Dr. Davis mentioned, so we will make those decisions in collaboration with them um, so that, of course, better outcomes, best outcomes for our students, faculty, and staff. There won't be any different um, decision-making processes uh, in progress, Dr. Davis, as a trained physician, will make the clinical decisions and set the policies that set forth based on science and data as we've prided ourselves on the past two and a half uh, years. So it won't be any shift in that. It will just be more collaboration. So if you take, metaphorically speaking, the notion of a safety net, our safety net has just gotten tighter gotten stronger and so we're able to have better responses faster responses and provide the best clinical update uh, as possible and so i'll stop there i could go on but with dr davis on board now we have a clinical expert who's able to not only collaborate with our montgomery county public school partners but our community as a whole and can someone discuss what that process in terms of going through how many applicants ended up being? Um, you know, we, we understand some people had dropped out and the search had to go. And then the county, um, county executive, you had talked about dropping the requirement for a doctor to be in that position. So I can tell you that, that uh, we looked at a total of, of approximately 15 or 16 candidates. Someone has the exact number in front of me in the moment. We looked at about 15 or 16 candidates, we put forward a number of uh, selections of this body the, 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 the press is aware of, and it got to a couple of points where got to a certain point and the candidates that we hit before withdrew for various reasons um, getting to this point. Um, as we were getting ready to do our next round, we had some discussion and decided that this was an opportunity to take the opportunity to, to split the position apart. and. Uh, it came at exactly the right moment, uh, along with, with with Dr. Davis showing up at exactly the right moment to join the, to join the team to be put forward the nomination. Thank you. That's it. No more questions. I believe there's a question on the chat here. Any comment on mental health in Montgomery County, especially for school age children, and lack of resources and support, Dr. Davis. Yeah, I mean, I think everybody knows that there is a shortage of mental health professionals across the country and Montgomery County has not escaped that. I know that the school system has actually um, trying to do a lot to, you know, focus on wellness um, and creating some of those resources for our kids. But, uh, you know, we continue to look and try to explain, expand that mental health and behavioral health network for for our kids and adults, and I look forward to working with um, the you know behavioral health uh, division within HHS on really targeting what those resources are for our kids. Thank you, uh, members of the media. Any more questions for Dr. Davis at this moment? Please use the chat. We'll give you a second. Going once, going twice. Stephanie, your hand still up. Um, Okay, thank you. That's it. I think we don't have any more questions at this 
point for you, Dr. Davis. So, uh, Mr. County Executive, may we continue with the public health update and other information? Yes, you may. Um, so, th <laughs> and thank you, Dr. Davis, for joining us, and uh, I look forward to working with you. Um, this this is going to be uh, you're you're in good hands, and you know, we had a really strong team going through this. Dr. Bridges, you did a really outstanding job of performing. The dual roles you had to perform. So I know that uh, Dr. Davis is going to come into a department where she has lots of support and a lot of folks who are, you know, actually were experienced and handled this, I think, really well, with or without a health officer, did a remarkably good job. So thank both Dr. Bridgers and Ms. Davis for stepping up to, uh, to, to move into this new position for us. Um, so we're going to talk about a few other things. Um, first, I want to make a brief comment about Thrive. Obviously, the council passed it yesterday. I am really disappointed in the council's vote. Um, some of the leading supporters of Thrive framed this as what we needed to do in order to house people who are coming here. And they cite this 200,000 person number. Um, I have to say that, you know, this is just patently not true. Um, that number comes out of a process, a planning process, in which all of the agencies, all the counties in the DC region, um, go to their planning departments and the planning departments make projections on how much they expect their counties to grow on a 30 year period based on the existing zoning. When those projections were made for 200,000 people, which I do not dispute that that is the projection, it was based on the existing zoning not Thrive, not the proposals made by Thrive, but on the zoning we put in place. And when they talk about missing middle and the need for you know, market rate housing, 85% of all the housing units that they've planned on over the next 25, 30 years, 85% of them would be market units because the most affordable units we get from new development is between 12 and a half and 15%. Our problem, in the long run and the short run is not building market units. Our problem is building affordable units. And the yield of 15% affordable units out of every 100 units that are built is simply not adequate either to address the problem that exists in Montgomery County today. Um, most people who are lack, out, lack adequate housing in the county today don't qualify for the subsidized housing that we do provide. It's not targeted on people below $60,000 in income. And the county's done over 20 master plans in 16 years that created the zoning capacity for the future growth of the county. So this persistent misstatement of you know, where we sit in terms of zoning and our potential for growth is really frustrating. And I'll just you know, point out that two of the things in Thrive's, the document itself, which ought to disabuse people of the idea this was about affordable housing. One was the statement that said clearly that the county needed to end its sole focus on affordable housing. A county that produced 6,700 affordable units over almost a 50 year period didn't actually have a sole focus on affordable housing. In fact, it had virtually no focus on affordable housing. We got a relatively small number of units compared to the need. And the other part of that document, there's a sentence that says this housing is meant to, to be to serve unsubsidized um, market rate housing in the county. That's unsubsidized market rate housing, which means not affordable housing. So this document's not about affordable housing. It doesn't address affordable housing in any substantive way. And I, there are a lot of people who bought the rhetoric. And I get that people don't read documents very carefully. I don't blame people for not reading every document that gets produced. But the fact is, when you read this document, it doesn't do what it says it's going to do. And that's really disappointing. Um, I pointed out in my most recent memo to the county council, as I pointed out over the past two years in multiple memos that we sent to the county council, there were important questions that never answered. Um, that's why I asked them to postpone this vote, because there's no urgency to vote right now. And there are multiple errors there. And there was a totally insufficient attention to racial equity, which we raised multiple times. 
I'm looking forward to working with the new council and the new planning board as we try to figure out how we're going to address the important issues that were not addressed by Thrive. I'll, to be blunt about this, I don't know how you plan a future of the county if you are not including in your planning what do you do to address the housing gaps that exist today and the housing gaps that are likely to be created in the future. Absent doing that, it's a picture of a county in 2050 that leaves out a whole lot of county residents. Um, on a brighter note, uh, this week I was very excited to see Montgomery County Public Schools expanding its electric bus fleet. Now has more electric buses than any public school system in the nation. And those numbers will only continue to grow as we move forward. I want to thank the school district for adopting the climate, the county's climate goals and acting on them. Electric buses cost more until you factor in the tax breaks our contractors get. Um, and then it becomes comparable to buying a diesel bus. And in the future, this move is going to pay big dividends because these buses not only reduce greenhouse gas emissions, they use less fuel and they require fewer repairs. They will be easier and cheaper to maintain than diesel buses are. I want to give credit to the students um, in MCPS because they've been unrelenting in putting pressure on myself, the council, and on the school system to take more aggressive actions to deal with climate change. Um, you know, we're creating a world that they're going to inherit. And if we don't create the right world, uh, we're not going to, we're, what we'll be handing them is an even bigger mess than we're giving them today. And there was yet another story. I didn't get to read the whole thing this morning, but basically we are not going to meet the climate goals we need to reach to avoid even more serious global warming. And global warming has multiple consequences. I'm not going to repeat them all, but, uh, We've got to do a better job, you know, particularly as a nation and, and, and globally. Uh, this announcement came just uh, one week ahead of another important milestone. This Monday, we open our Bookfield Bus Depot, which is the new standard for sustainable public transportation. It's going to have its own energy source with solar panels and batteries, uh, and it creates a microgrid. And eventually, we are going to have an all electric fleet of ride on buses, and hopefully, we'll be able to move that even more quickly than we're planning on doing it now. So those are two big milestones. It's really good to have the school system as a partner in this. And I look forward as we continue to push forward on, on uh, addressing climate change here in the county. In other good news, um, this week I sent a $15 million supplemental appropriation request to the county council to prepare the North Bethesda metro area for an exciting project with, an educational, re with educational research partners that will bring an advanced computational research capability to the county. The money is going to be spent on an essential startup costs and operational needs. They're going to focus on virtual reality and artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data, um, all those buzzwords you hear about that are coming increasingly into play in the world of life sciences. And this is going to be focused on both life sciences and also doing some work for our hospitality industries. We're going to have more detail on this. We're going to be doing a press conference in a couple of weeks. Um, so I'll tell you more about it when we get to the press conference, but it's really exciting. It lays down a really important marker for Montgomery County. And as part of an agreement we reached with the University of Maryland a couple of years ago um, to bring life sciences re research to Montgomery County from the university system. So I'm very excited about this. Uh, in our health update this week, uh, flu light symptoms have been driving up visits uh, to doctor's offices and hospitals nationwide. And in some areas of the country, the situation is actually alarming. Um, they are beginning to fill up particularly their pediatric beds, but it's putting strains on the healthcare system. Children's Hospital in the district is uh, among several area facilities that cater to the children and they're at or near capacity because of these respiratory illnesses. Uh, we're dealing with a combination of COVID-19 and its variants. And we now have multiple variants that are sharing the stage rather than just one main actor and a couple of sub actors. So that's been a change. We've got um, the flu, which many people are expecting to be a little bit heavier this year than it was in previous years because we're mostly unmasked right now, and but kept flu numbers low. And frankly, probably the childhood uh, respiratory virus um, problem 
uh, kept that lower was the fact that everybody was wearing masks and more separated. Um, as we all come back together now, um, all of these respiratory diseases are going to be spreading more easily. And to the point of an earlier question, that's why we're going to have to pay close attention um, to the um, hospitalization rates in the county, because these three can combine to put our system under pretty severe stress. Um, health experts say that the rise in cases in hospitals doesn't have as much to do with COVID-19 as, as people think. The flu cases are, you know, a, a part of this, and as is this the RSV lice, uh, virus. Um, the RSV virus affects um, mostly younger children and, and seniors, and it has uh, more severe effects on seniors who are health compromised and on young children who are health compromised. So we do have these three viruses that we're going to have to deal with. And as we see its impact on hospitals and on the community, we will um, be deciding what's the appropriate course of action. As for COVID-19 this week, our current case and hospitalizations remain low and we want to keep them that way. I'm concerned for the upcoming winter as are lots of scientists right now. There's already been a surge in Europe and when Europe surges, we're usually um, not too far behind. I think we're about a three week, dif three week difference between us and England. Uh, wastewater detection surveillance is uh, starting to see upticks of cases in the Northeast, including in nearby Pennsylvania. And we must uh, be deliberate in our efforts to protect ourselves and our families. And we're gonna have to keep severe cases at a minimum and our hospitalization rate in this county as low as possible. I know that they are, um, the federal government is talking about the critical importance of people getting boosted and people getting the flu vaccine. Uh, this is one of the lead stories this morning. We can avoid most of the deaths that are caused by COVID if people would just get vaccinated. Uh, I've said this before, we're at the point when virtually nobody needs to die from this if people will come out and get their vaccinations. So we're encouraging people, please get vaccinated and get the flu vaccine as well. Hospitals are seeing patients with multiple viruses. Um, that just complicates health outcomes and puts more stress on a person's body. Uh, earlier this month, Yale University and the Commonwealth Fund published a scientific blog showing how much investment in booster marketing and promotion now will save lives and money in the future. The study looked at our current vaccination rates and compared them with two other scenarios. One that had flu-like vaccination rates, which is about 50% of the population. And the second scenario is what would happen if we achieved 80% coverage of our booster rates. And as you can see from the graphs they published, it's clear the number of projected hospitalizations and deaths that can be avoided is pretty substantial. It also equates into costs and strains on our healthcare systems. The study also estimated that direct medical costs be re could be reduced by $11 billion from Medicaid alone under the flu level vaccine scenario and $13 billion under the 80% boosted scenario. An additional 3.5 to 4.5 billion in savings would accrue to Medicaid as well. So this isn't just a health issue, it's a financial issue. Um, we don't need to be spending money. People don't need to be dying. We ought to be doing everything we can and we'll continue to do everything we can to encourage people to get the boosters, get the flu shots, and you know, consider whether or not to wear masks voluntarily when you're going into more crowded places because now you have three things to try to avoid. Um, this Saturday, we're gonna be hosting our third booster rama, speaking of boosters, at the Westfield Wheaton Mall. I wanna thank Westfield again for their support of our outreach efforts. So they offer five $50 gift certificates that'll be raffled off to those who get boosted this, um, this weekend on Saturday. And so please help us promote booster rama and join us on Saturday in Wheaton. I also want to take a moment to thank um, all the volunteers, the individuals, organizations, and businesses who volunteered their time and efforts during this pandemic. Tomorrow night, I'm going to be attending our Medical Reserve Corps Volunteer Appreciation Event to meet and thank them in person. At the end of August this year, our volunteers had worked more than 82,000 hours and saved the county and our taxpayers over $3 million 
Um, and that doesn't include the medical costs avoided by the people they were able to help. This reflects the compassion and commitment of our residents um, for their neighbors and during the toughest of times. And there are also um, other people to think, but a lot of them uh, we're gonna be trying to acknowledge in this one um, volunteer event. So um, thank all of you very much. And I hope if you individually know people who served as volunteers, let them know how much you appreciate how much you appreciate the work they did for the county. Uh, Dr. Joseph Chewy, the resident of North Potomac, gave more than 500 hours himself, and mostly as a vaccinator doing COVID testing, and he's an infectious disease doctor and knows how important public health is, and volunteering was a way for him to use his medical training to help the county, and his efforts were quite a gift to the county. So I hope you consider covering or featuring our volunteers and volunteer programs, and their stories will always inspire others to help out themselves. Uh, in many ways throughout COVID, volunteers played critical roles to support the county, not just in the health arena directly, but in passing out clothing and food and hosting clinics. Um, volunteers helped make the county's response as effective as it was, and I just want everybody to know how much I appreciate what they did. And lastly, for my part, uh, just a few words about um, MPX or monkeypox. Uh, there's only been one new case reported in Montgomery County in the last two weeks, and this is great news. It demonstrates our outreach and community efforts are working, but we must continue to vaccinate high-risk individuals. Hundreds of people have asked for and now received the vaccine for monkeypox, MPX, and we're gonna continue to sharing information about its spread and how it spreads from um, skin to skin contact because education about disease is one of the best tools we have in terms of preventing more cases. We've made great progress, but we can't lose sight of um, the problem and make sure we continue to pay attention to it. So I'll stop there and turn it over to Sean for his presentation. Thank you, Mr. Connie Executive. Uh, so just to start out, as we've done in previous weeks, uh, we continue to monitor those variants that are distributing um, or, or being transmitted uh, throughout our region, as well as throughout the U.S. and in Europe. Uh, this is a, the snapshot of our, our region of the country. Uh, again, most of the cases, most of the, the variants that we're seeing right now are BA5 or a subvariant of BA5, which includes the, the two BQ subvariants, the BF subvariant. Uh, again, as these are all related to BA5, um, this is uh, it's important to know that because that is a component of the bivalent booster and why we recommend uh, that booster so much. Even if you've had previous boosters, uh, it's important. Um, everyone who's eligible for a booster uh, can now get the bivalent booster, um, age five and up. Uh, going on, as our county executive shared, we we have seen the uh, COVID transmission numbers come down um, via the the PCR test surveillance. Um, that's a that's a good trend. Um, however, we are seeing uh, conversely some increases in hospitalizations. Um, it's likely because of the increased uh, overall um, respiratory and, and febrile illnesses that we're seeing that are serious enough to cause people to go to an outpatient clinic or go to a hospital, um, that that is allowing us to catch more people who may also have COVID as a contributing or, or more significant um, component of their illness. Um, but we are seeing that increase in, um, uh, in patient beds with a COVID diagnosis. Um, and continuing to track it. Uh, um, our hospital uh, our hospital beds are very similar with the, the COVID patients. Many of the, those patients have been trans, uh, transferred over to the alternate care site if they need extended care rehabilitation following their um, initial hospitalization with COVID. And so we're seeing that, that ACS number uh, increasing week to week. It's, it's now about the highest it's been since the beginning of October. Uh, again, we're encouraged that people continue to come out and get their um, get their booster shot. At this point, they're all bivalent boosters, which is 
is great. Um, and we want it, we want to keep encouraging it. We know that um, people pick this time of year usually to go out and get their flu shot. And we know we're asking them to get also a COVID shot at this time. Looking at our influenza surveillance, uh, this is the, the national surveillance. You can see again um, that we are on the, the uprise for uh, flu transmissions across the country. Um, and so that's again why we're, we're letting people know that even if you have a negative uh, COVID rapid test or PCR test, um, there could be other uh, even serious um, respiratory viruses like the flu that are out there. Uh, the flu is, is likely not um, hospitalizing as many people as COVID, but it's still contributing to, um, uh, to those cases. And if someone is um, unfortunate enough to get both flu and COVID, uh, uh, certainly they're, they're likely to have a, a more difficult time of it. Uh, looking at the overall um, vaccination levels for, for um, influenza, we are likely about halfway to our annual uh, number of, of uh, vaccinations uh, in Montgomery County. We have about 18% of our population who've gotten that flu vaccine. Um, in many years, it tends to be in the, the mid uh, 30 percentile. We're hoping uh, that um, with the earlier onset of influenza this year, of the influenza season, um, that people take the precautions and, and we'd love to see that. Um, that, that vaccination rate for influenza be much higher this year. Um, but this is where we are currently. As you can see, again, um, many of our seniors are getting the influenza shot. Uh, and that may be, that is usually at the um, direction and request of their healthcare providers. Um, and uh, there's also a pneumococcal uh, vaccine that, that is recommended at that age group. But again, we're recommending everyone get the flu shot uh, this year. Uh, going back to the, the RSV or respiratory syncytial uh, virus, um, as we mentioned last week, this is, again, um, a respiratory disease that um, usually manifests as a mild illness with cold-like symptoms. It does affect a lot of children, um, but the, the individuals it's, it's most uh, dangerous to are those very young children or those with uh, very young children with underlying health conditions. Um, and it, it can be life-threatening in that case. It can cause bronchiolitis um, and, and other um, uh, secondary infections. And so we do recommend any, any parents who have newborns, very young children, um, if they have a respiratory illness, please, uh, or any illness, please contact your healthcare provider. Even if you have a negative COVID test, it's important to, to talk to your healthcare provider and rule out something more serious. Um, RSV can also be dangerous, uh, again, to our, our seniors, um, uh, you know, whose immune systems are not as strong as those who are, are younger. And so uh, the guidance is really similar to, to COVID. If you're in a higher risk group, um, please consider using a mask when you're in high uh, density public places, particularly if it's indoors, um, to help prevent these, these respiratory spreads. Uh, again, what we're seeing is this, um, the RSV is, compared to previous years, uh, occurring a little bit earlier in the season. That's this line uh, over here on the left that is still going up. You can see it's, it's several weeks earlier than what we've seen in previous years. Um, and we're seeing the test positivity uh, very elevated right now. So uh, again, messages have gone out from the state uh, health department out to our um, healthcare providers recommending that uh, if that they also rule this out amongst populations who are at risk. Uh, looking at our MPOX cases, we'll go through this quickly. The, the good news is um, that the cases are coming down. However, there is there are still some transmissions in the state of Maryland. As our county executive mentioned, we've had um, you know you can see the cases coming down nationally. Um, within our county, we've only had one new case identified in the last two weeks, um, but we're still doing the disease investigations, trying to make sure that um, we uh, have 
as few transmissions as possible after identifying a case. Um, we do continue to offer vaccinations uh, in the county, both um, in the Silver Spring Wheaton area, as well as uh, up county as well. So if you're looking for a vaccination for this, um, please go online, uh, let us know um, by, by completing the pre-registration form. Uh, we may begin uh, taking walk-ups very soon. We're trying to coordinate the timing of that with our state healthcare partners. Um, vaccines are also now um, being distributed out to um, some additional providers uh, beyond the health department, including some healthcare facilities and, and some pharmacies. So um, again, we're just trying to broaden the access to these vaccines. Uh, that is the update right now from um, public health. I just want to um, again, echo our county executive's comments of how much we've appreciated the volunteers uh, who have worked with us over the last several years with COVID. Um, they've made an unbelievable uh, impact to our ability to respond. They were among the first people who showed up uh, to help us do uh, answer the phones when people were calling in uh, with illnesses and to, to try to identify contacts of those who were ill. Um, and they've worked in in every phase of our response. Um, and we, we truly wouldn't be where we are today as a county without their help. Uh, now I'd like to turn it back over to Lorna. Thank you, Mr. O'Donnell. Then I believe, uh, Ms. Thompson, do you have an update or was that included on Mr. O'Donnell's? <laughs> Mr. O'Donnell covered the MPOX for us this week. So thank you, Mr. O'Donnell. And thank you, Lorna, for checking. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Stoddard. Yeah, I just wanted to, one additional piece of information. I was privileged to represent the county executive on Monday with the governor announcing the Maryland Mesonet program, uh, which is a which is actually a partnership that's being established at the state level between the Maryland Department of Emergency Management and the uh, University of Maryland uh, School of Atmospheric uh, Science. Uh, basically, a mesonet is a. It's going to be 75 stations, uh, weather monitoring stations across the state that are well integrated. They take samples every few seconds, then aggregate them over about a five minute period. They'll provide information to local emergency managers across the state who will be able to provide better warning uh, in advance of weather events. They'll also be able to um, respond to weather events and allocate resources in a more effective way. And the reason why um, Montgomery County was invited is actually this program started originate out of Montgomery County. It came from some of our early work around the climate action plan that the county executive uh, had had directed immediately upon his uh, his, his election in 2018. And uh, obviously, uh, we we saw the value of, of increased data availability in in understanding the impacts of climate driven uh, weather changes. We we carried that uh, message up to the state. The state embraced it, and and all the way up to the governor, including it in his budget uh, this year. And so obviously we're incredibly pleased to have been a big part of the origination of the project and we look forward uh, to that project being completed over the next few years. It will provide us critical data in Montgomery County and across the state of Maryland in how we more effectively adapt to and respond to climate change uh, in our future. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Stoddard. Um, Krista King, I believe you had your hand raised up before we transition to the public health update. Do you have any questions? Although I believe that Dr. Davis has uh, left the platform for this afternoon. No, no, Christy, okay. Uh, next up, uh, reporters remember to use the chat for the Q&A portion of this presentation. And I do see that Stephanie Ramirez has a follow-up question for the county executive and uh, health department officials. Good afternoon again, Stephanie. Hi again, thank you all. Um, just a, a quick follow-up question. Can, can someone explain um, the difference in the experiences here? You said that Dr. Davis has um, clinical experience, whereas we know Dr. Travis Gills, uh, his work was as a, a child physician uh, or pediatrician. Can you, can you explain the differences, please? Sure, I can do that for you. Uh, there, there's essentially it's the same thing. Dr. Dr. Gills was a pediatrician, which meant that he had at some point in his career uh, clinical experience as well. And, and Dr. Davis is describing essentially the same thing, that she comes to this job with a wealth of, of clinical experience, albeit not as a pediatrician, but in other areas of medicine. What other 
other areas of medicine you're talking about then? And then obviously then more so with adults. Uh, I think yeah, more so with adults, but I think family practice, family medical practice is how she described it, which is about the care and, and of, of not just the children in the family, but the adults and and uh, uh, older family members as well. So it's across the spectrum of, of health care for an entire family. And yep. from a more holistic perspective. The other thing that I think Dr. Davis alluded to this in her work uh, uh, with Aldate is that she has focused a lot on health health equity, which is means yeah. not just on uh, the practice of, of clinical medicine, but also the wraparound services that you aim to address the underlying uh, inequities that lead to those health outcomes. Like she used the example of diabetes, which is often uh, diabetes is often a um, a manifestation of underlying issues in 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 someone's life that may be a lack of healthy food, lack of uh, access to exercise. And so I think Dr. Davis has, has a really, really well-rounded understanding of not just what the clinical manifestation of disease is, but how, how an individual may have gotten to that point and how you can avoid them getting that in the future. Dr. Bridges is right. Dr. Stoddard is right. One of the things that we, we that I appreciate about her being here is that we in the department are working from a perspective a framework of social determinants of health, which is not just the work in the public health space and the public health service and, and primary care, but is also about all those things that contribute to health and well-being um, from an aging perspective, mental health issues, the housing issues, nutrition, uh, exercise, diet, and rest. All of those things are part of the largest scope of the department. So her joining this will help us to bring make sure that there's a better integration across the department on, on between health and the human services elements that support health and well-being. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Members of the media, I do not see any more requests for questions on the chat. I'll wait a second or two to see if anybody else has questions. I don't see any hands up here on the chat. Oh, Katie, Bree? Uh, yes, sorry. I just... Um... I wanted to park my car before we uh, ask a question. I'll make that a Wednesday. So this one is for uh, Health and Human Services. It's the same question that I asked earlier. To, uh, so you know, we are seeing those rise in cases. We just saw them, but you know, while cases look pretty good in Montgomery County, you know, is a mass mandate potentially a recommendation? This is for um, Health and Human Services and, and others who can comment on this. Mm -hmm. Did anybody oh. hear the question well? Yes, yes. Okay. yes you did, so, Dr. Bridgers? Okay. So, Katie, I think Dr. Davis answered the question. We haven't gotten to that bridge. We still continue to use data analysis and assess what the science is guiding us on. There hasn't been an impetus to return to an indoor mask mandate. Yes, there are three viruses that are out in the community. COVID hasn't evolved into a seasonal virus-like illness. This has been with us for two and a half years and counting RSV and influenza typically occur when folks go inside, tighter spaces, fall and winter months, and they are controlled. So when you look at all three of those viruses, those lower respiratory and upper, and upper respiratory viruses, we look for individuals to do a couple of things, to consult their primary care physician regarding their illness, because there may be other uh, underlying health conditions and chronic illnesses that they may have that may require them, especially if they are immunocompromised at any time throughout the year to wear a face mask. Clearly in indoor crowded spaces, individuals have the options of wearing face masks if they still have some challenges or still suffer from the effects of long COVID and have some respiratory inflammation or some other respiratory illnesses that would require them to wear a mask. But we need to continue and we will continue to assess whether or not there's a requirement to wear a mask, and if and when to wear a mask, either in a community setting, either in a school setting, or as a community as a whole. The, the only thing I would add is masks can be an effective tool to, to stop, slow the spread of a respiratory virus, like COVID or even uh, influenza. It can be, can be positive. Influenza and morpho might spread, but I digress. The, the most effective mechanism to prevent the spread is vaccination. So we are focused on the vaccination efforts at this point, and um, any any decision by uh, the health team to 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 recommend masks again to the county council would only be uh, you know uh, you know that would be a far down pathway that we would consider. And obviously, the focus right now is making sure people get vaccinated before we see our winter surge. And so, there's you never say this could never happen again because obviously masks do work and they're effective, but 
I think the focus area is obviously much more on trying to get to trying to prevent us from getting to the point where we're having those conversations. Thank you so much. Thank you, Katie. Any more questions, members of the media? Going once. Going twice. I guess we're done for today. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Have a great afternoon. Stay safe. And we'll see you again next time. Bye -bye. Thank you all. Thank you.